We know from a variety of studies, not ones I've done, but from others that survivability in cancer treatment is totally dependent on your muscle mass. If you have low muscle mass and they refer to it as cancer cachexia, that actually determines your failure in cancer therapy. So actually having muscle mass is probably the number one protection you can have. If you get, if you're unfortunate enough to get cancer, to survive the treatments is totally dependent on your muscle mass. Hello and welcome to Discovering True Health, your weekly deep dive into health and wellness. Thank you so much for joining us today. So today we'll be learning why our muscular skeletal system may be our most important organ. We'll also be learning a how a muscle-centric nutrition approach contributes to our health and longevity and can prevent obesity and other health issues such as cancer. We'll also be looking at the essential roles that protein and amino acids play, what our optimal dietary protein needs are, the ideal timing of protein intake, best sources, and everything we need to know about protein synthesis. Joining me today is Don Lehman. He's a professor of food and science and human nutrition at one of the top agricultural colleges in the world, the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign College of Agriculture. He's dedicated over 40 years investigating the intricate role of dietary protein in muscle protein synthesis and the impact of diet and exercise on obesity, type 2 diabetes, and metabolic syndrome in adults. His research has significantly contributed to our understanding of the interplay between nutrition, muscle health, and our overall well-being. So thank you so much for coming on with me today. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Well, thank you, Christy, and thanks for that introduction. <laughs> Absolutely. So now you have spent many years, as I just mentioned, studying and researching in your field. I'd love to hear more about your journey and how you ended up focusing on nutritional biochemistry. Well, as with a lot of people, there's a lot of serendipity in it. Uh, I grew up on a sort of a small farm in Illinois. So I always had an interest in food. Uh, I grew up playing sports. So I always had an interest in muscle. So those are sort of two backdrops. And in school, I was interested in science. And I grew up in a really pretty small town. I think the high school I went to had maybe 400 people or something. So my horizons weren't particularly big, uh, but I knew I wanted to study chemistry. So I went off in Illinois State University and started st studying chemistry. And while I was doing it, I realized I had a lot more interest and in, and skill in biochemistry than say organic. Uh, and I sort of drifted into more of biochemistry and I met up with a professor by the name of Arlen Richardson, who was studying aging and protein turnover, protein synthesis. And I turned out I really had a good intuition and skill for it. And we published our first papers that way. And he basically said, you know, I think you really ought to consider a PhD. I sort of shrugged and said, really? And he said, and I have a group at Minnesota that would be perfect for you. Let me make the contact. And so Next thing I knew, I was studying nutritional biochemistry at Minnesota and protein turnover and muscle uh, with Laval Henderson and Pat Swan and, and people there. And basically, the rest is sort of history. I got really into it and really enjoyed the combination of nutrition and food and biochemistry and muscle health and all that. So that's kind of how I wandered into it. And it certainly wasn't any grandiose plan on my part. <laughs> I love to hear that. I love to hear the journey and how it kind of the interwovenness and the serendipity. I mean, it's, it's a good, you know, it's a good example of having great mentors and having people who take an interest in, in showing you a path. And then frankly, having the boldness to say, okay, I'm going to do that. <laughs> Absolutely. It takes all of that. Yeah. It's so important to have people that believe in you and that, that are guiding you along the way. Now, you've been at this for such a long time. What are some of your foundational principles on your philosophy around nutrition? You know, I, again, I grew up on a farm, so I was around very natural food. So I, I'd say my philosophy in general is pretty simple. One, eat 
fresh foods, eat as little processed foods as possible. I, I like to tell people, you know, if you're, if you're shopping on the shelves in a grocery store, you're probably making a mistake. You know, all the good food is around the outside. And, you know, from there, you know, I definitely, you know, you mentioned sort of the muscle centric idea. I'm very protein centric. I think we need to start our meals with a protein concept. And that might be vegetarian, it might be more omnivore, but you need to know what you're doing with protein. The next step is sort of, I think of a, every plate, every time you eat sort of in three parts, one is protein. The next is fiber, vegetables, maybe you know high fiber fruits like blueberries, raspberries, and then a carbohydrate section. And the carbohydrate section and the protein section sort of need to be about equal in size. And so that's sort of my philosophy. How do you balance that? Um, protein is a critical issue. And then your carbohydrate issue is in proportion to your exercise. So if you are basically sedentary, you have very little room for carbohydrates. If you're an elite marathon runner, you can eat a lot of them. And so, you know, I think those are my fundamentals of how I, I live personally and also how I like to try and teach it. Got it. Now you mentioned protein. Um, can you kind of provide a brief overview of the fundamental concepts of protein and amino acids and their role, uh, their vital role in nutrition and our health? Sure. The, um, the concept of protein, we've known that there was something called protein in our diet way back into the 1800s, even before we knew what protein was. Um, protein is basically a series of amino acids. There are 20 amino acids. So the analogy I always like using with people is that protein is actually nothing more than like a vitamin pill. We don't really require a pill. What we require is the 14 vitamins inside the pill. You know, we don't spend our time talking about the color of the pill or the size of the pill. We talk about, does it have vitamin C or vitamin D? Protein is actually nothing more than a vitamin pill for amino acids. It's a food delivery system. Mm -hmm. So one of the first lessons I learned in my graduate school training was that we actually don't have a requirement for protein. We have a requirement for nine essential amino acids and what we call nonspecific nitrogen, which is basically the other, you know, the other amino acids. Uh, but they can come in, we can make 11 of the amino acids if we have enough nitrogen, but nine of them we have to have in the diet, just like vitamin D or vitamin C. So anyway, that's sort of the overview. Amino acids are the key and, you know, back, we started talking about protein requirements back in the early 1900s, even before we had identified all the amino acids. One of the arguments that we're making now is we now know the amino acids, we know their requirements. We need to stop talking about protein, start talking about amino acid requirements. Interesting. And what are some of the, you know, basic amino acids that are necessary and where can we get them specifically? The good news is that basically every protein out there has all of the amino acids and certainly all the essential, but the issue is they're in different proportions in each protein. And so what we now know is that animal proteins, because humans are basically animals, has a proportion of amino acids that's exactly right. So whether it's milk or eggs or fish or meats, the balance is correct. When you go to plants, plants have amino acids for the sake of building plants. So roots and stems and seeds and flowers are kind of different than hearts and livers and brains and arms. And so plants have amino acids in the wrong proportion. So it's not that plants aren't good sources of protein, but they're unbalanced sources. And so you have to have a lot of skill to, to put those together. Three amino acids that we always talk about that are critical are leucine, uh, lysine, and methionine. These are three of the essentials. And they usually tell you the difference between plant and animal foods. If you get the right balance of those three, you basically are probably balancing your diet correctly. Plants tend to be very low in those three. 
animal products tend to be very high in those three. Very interesting. So it sounds like we need animal meat in our diets and such things uh, to replace meat like plants or bugs <laughs> probably wouldn't be ideal yeah. for our health and well-being. Um, we can we can do modifications, but people have to have a lot of knowledge and food skills to do it. Um, do we need meats? Not necessarily. Dairy and eggs and fish uh, are perfectly fine. So you can make different combinations. If you, uh, for whatever reason, don't want to consume red meat, you can still eat eggs and dairy and cheese and things like that. What we know though, is right now Americans get about 65% of their amino acids from animal proteins. Uh, the issue is as we go down, if we make a more plant-based diet, where's the threshold where people are likely to get into trouble? And we now know from various modeling exercises that if you get below 50, maybe 40% animal protein, you have to increase your total protein to be equal. You cannot reach your requirement for essential amino acids if your dietary protein, if less than 40% of it comes from animal protein. So that's the kind of information the average public doesn't get. You know, you have to have more total protein and more total calories to be a vegetarian than you do to be an omnivore. Uh, and that's because of the essential amino acids. Understood. And would you say there are, or how would we determine kind of quality of protein sources? Are there certain, as far as animal protein sources, are there certain sources that are better than others as far as the balance of amino acids that we need? Yeah, there's a lot of difference in, in proteins. Um, you know, meats and eggs, fish, um, you're getting a lot of different kinds of proteins in those sources. And so that kind of averages itself out. Um, places where we eat more purified proteins, things like whey protein has become very popular. Uh, casein is the primary protein in yogurts, for example, and dairy in, uh, in cheeses and in Greek yogurts. And they have sort of different properties. Uh, whey protein is one of the very best proteins because it has extremely high essential amino acids and it's very... Uh, easy to consume, and it's very quickly digested. Casein, on the other hand, is very slowly digested, and so it gives you more uh, appetite suppression. It, it has higher satiety, we might say. So, you know, those are differences. Um, when you get into plant proteins, now there's a lot of differences. Uh, if we look at grains, grains are inherently the worst proteins. Uh, and unfortunately, most Americans get 80% of their plant-based protein comes from wheat, wow. which is probably one of the very worst proteins out there. It's basically almost deficient. It's devoid of lysine, very low in leucine and very low in methionine, the three I mentioned earlier. So unfortunately, you know, people would say we should eat more uh, beans and lentils and nuts and seeds. Those are the better plant-based proteins, but that's not what Americans eat. We eat wheat, and that's a really awful plant-based protein. Uh, the legumes like pea and, and uh, soy are very low in what we call sulfur amino acids, methionine. They're also fairly low in leucine. Um, and so, you know, now you start thinking, well, how do I start mixing and matching these? Again, if you start doing that, it takes a lot of knowledge. It takes food skills. Uh, it takes liking a lot of beans <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of fiber, uh, but it's just it's just more difficult. And so what we know is that most people who go to more vegetarian type diets, they lower their total quantity of protein they consume and also the quality. And as I was mentioning before, we think there's a threshold of around 40%, maybe even a little higher where they're at real risk for essential amino acids. And so, uh, you know, it's just something that the more we recommend plant-based diets, the more knowledge we're going to have to make sure we don't get unintended consequences to help. 
That is great um, advice. So basically it's, it can be done, but it's, it's going to take a lot of pinpointed, you know. Yeah. It takes a lot of knowledge. It takes a lot of food skills, time, and it takes financial resources to find those kinds of proteins. You know, it's not just eating a, a, another slice of bread or more pasta. That's not going to make it. Got it. Um, now you kind of touched on this um when you were just speaking, absorption rates, um, are, are there anything else we should know about absorption rates when selecting yeah. protein? Yeah, that's great. That, that's a great comment. Um, when we evaluate protein, there's two things that we're looking at. One is uh, the amino acid ratios that I just talked about. And the other is digestibility or bioavailability that you mentioned. When we look at animal proteins, Basically, they're very well digested. So the digestibility is probably above 95%. When we start looking at plant proteins, uh, whole grains or, or edamame, you know, or soy or, or different you know, plant proteins, pea proteins, they range from 50 to maybe 70% digestible. So if you pick up a uh, uh, a cereal box that says it has 10 grams, typically that's too high. It says it has four grams of, of wheat protein uh, on the box. Chances are only 50% of that's digestible. So it actually only has two. And so those are the kinds of things, again, that the American public doesn't understand very well. If you look at beans and lentils, chances are somewhere between 50 and 70% of that is digestible. So you start thinking about how much you have to have to get your essential amino acid. It becomes a lot of volume. And that leads us to what, what amount do we need to have? Um, is it based on our body weight? And how do we kind of figure that out and calculate that? So, so right now, again, um, we're still using a protein requirement and that protein requirement is based on body weight. So uh, we typically and I always stop and think about this because I always think of it in, in metric terms, in terms of kgs. Um, the uh, the RDA, the minimum uh, RDA, considered a minimum requirement, RDA stands for recommended dietary allowance, which is actually the minimum to prevent a deficiency, is 0.8 grams per kg uh, per kilogram body weight. <clears throat> that translates into about 0.35 grams per pound. Okay. So that's the minimum. But what we also know is that for every nutrient, there's a range of intake. Uh, I always like to start that conversation with saying, you know, most people understand that for something like vitamin C. Uh, we know that 60 milligrams of vitamin C will prevent the deficiency called scurvy. And if you look on a vitamin pill, that might be the amount. But probably during COVID and during the winter, probably half your listeners will take extra vitamin C, maybe 500 milligrams, maybe 1,000 milligrams. So they'll take 10 times the RDA because they think it optimizes their immune response. In protein, we tend to trade that RDA, that minimum is also a maximum. And what we know is that there's a healthy range going from 0.8 grams up to around 2.5, which is above 2.2, uh, it's well above a gram per pound. Okay. So there's a huge range there. And so we think the optimum level for people is much more in the range of 0.6 to 0.7 grams per pound, as okay. opposed to the minimum of 0.3. Uh, and again, as I mentioned before, if you look at vegetarians, they typically are right around that minimum RDA. And so they're really right at the right at the edge. In fact, if you use the national survey data called NHANES, the National Health and, and uh, Nutrition Education Surveys, if you use that data, what we know is that 40% of the women over 60 are actually below the RDA. Wow. So if they shift to a more vegetarian diet, they're going to be at severe risk for, for malnutrition. That is really good to know. So, so what you're saying basically is the recommended dietary allowance is a minimum to 
prevent being severely deficient. And we should kind of look at it as that. And the amount we actually need is much higher. I think you said around eight per. Yeah. So per it's pack. about double the RDA. So we've done multiple studies in my lab looking at the minimum 0.8 versus 1.6, double it. And we always find that the adults are healthier at 1.6. Got it. And what, how did, how was the RDA calculated? How did they come to that number? Great question. Um, so by definition, the RDA is, is determined by what we call nitrogen balance. So they basically feed an extremely low protein diet to young males. It's done with 25 year old males who are physically active and healthy, normal weight. Uh, and they basically say, what level of nitrogen would they lose per day? And so that therefore becomes the RDA for protein. How much do we have to replace? We know that that short-term nitrogen balance totally underestimates protein needs. It's done with young males, so it has no relationship to older females. It's done with physically active, ideal weight individuals, and we know 75% of Americans are overweight. So the, the, the point of all that is that we have an RDA that is absolutely optimized for the minimum for healthy people. It has nothing to do with the optimum for adults in the United States. Wow, that is really important information. And, and is that kind of across the board with a lot of the RDA standards for different types of- uh, yeah, Again, the RDAs are designed to- prevent a deficiency. So in vitamin C, I mentioned, we have a clear deficiency. Uh, in, in thiamine, we have a clear deficiency of beriberi. In vitamin D, we have a clear deficiency of rickets. So we have something we can prevent. In protein, malnutrition is an issue of growth or it's not, it, they're very long-term outcomes. So there's not a clear deficiency. People would say, well, look at albumin levels in the blood. Well, that takes months to change that. And so what we don't have is a clear deficiency like scurvy to put our finger on. So we're using a really crude estimate of nitrogen balance. Got it. Understood. And with that said, how do our dietary protein needs um, differ from, let's say, adolescents to when these studies are done in adolescents compared to an adult or somebody maybe in their 60s or their specific yeah. considerations for different age groups? Um, that's a great question. That's sort of what we, you know we've been working on in the last 20 years. One of the things to know about the RDA is if you look in the first year of life, the RDA for protein for an infant is 2.2 grams per kg. And then it goes down as you get older, down to 0.8 grams per kg at around 14. So the question is, does it really go down? Mm -hmm. The question, the, the argument is, well, children are growing, so they need more protein. But what we've learned is that whether you're 16 or whether you're 65, your body has to make somewhere between 250 to 300 grams of new protein per day, even though you're not growing. And so the question is, how do you do that? And what we know is as you get older, your efficiency, this is called a repair and replacement concept, protein turnover. As you get older, the efficiency goes down. So we think that when you, trans when you move from a growth period, say 30 years and younger, to an adult period of not growing, we think your protein requirement actually goes up. And so we think that you know, 40, 50, 60 year olds really do need 1.6 grams per kg to protect their muscles. Where when you're younger, you actually are protected by hormones because you're trying to grow. Uh, where when you're older, now you're less efficient and, it, it, and you're Muscle protein metabolism is based on very different things like quality of the diet, exercise, things like that. That is so interesting. And and with that said, are there some good ways that we can overcome this reduced efficiency of protein utilization as we age? One of the landmark studies uh, was done by the Galveston Group, Bob Wolf and colleagues uh, back in 
around 2000. And what they were looking at was this aging phenomena. We know that protein synthesis goes down with age. Uh, and I published that back in my master's degree. We were looking at, you know, why does that happen? And it has to do with the machinery. Why do ribosomes and messenger RNAs change with age, et cetera? Uh, and they were looking at that. And they did a very interesting experiment where they gave young males a uh, 15 gram protein meal, and they got a very nice response in protein synthesis and muscle. They gave the same 15 grams to a group of 65 year olds and they got no effect at all. So basically oh. the protein had no effect. They then went back and gave double the protein to 30 grams, 32 grams at the meal, the young adults didn't get any additional effect, but the older adults now responded just the same as the young ones. So mm -hmm. basically by giving more protein, it demonstrated that while the efficiency of protein use is going down, the capacity to respond isn't disappearing as long as you give enough. So what we now know is that the quantity of protein the quality of that protein, particularly an amino acid known as leucine, uh, and the meal distribution and exercise all come into play. All of these things affect how muscle responds as we get older. Interesting. Now you just mentioned leucine. Is there are there particular um, sources that are optimal sources of the one? The one thing that we've used and the and the one that has been extensively studied is whey protein. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at if you look at meats, for example, meats contain a, of the protein about nine percent is leucine. Okay. Eggs are about nine point nine to ten. Whey protein is eleven to twelve percent. It's really high. Uh, soy is about. Um, is about a little below eight, is about 8%. Wheat and quinoa are about 6%. And so you can see that with wheat protein you'd, versus whey, you'd need twice as much protein. So with, with uh, what we discovered is that there's a threshold for stimulating muscle protein synthesis, and we can go into that mechanism, but leucine, it requires somewhere around two and a half to three grams. To get that with wheat, uh, using whole grain cereal type things or flours, it requires almost 3,700 calories at a meal to get that amount with wheat. You know, it takes it takes something like 43 grams of wheat protein versus 23 grams of of whey protein. So that's where quality comes into to play. You know, for an older adult. Um, whey protein becomes very good. I, I like to use it at breakfast because you can get to this muscle protection level with 23, 25 grams of protein, where with uh, plant-based proteins, you need 35 to 45 grams to even come close. So anyway, definitely differences. Animal proteins always have more and whey protein is by far the highest that we know of. Got it. Now, yeah, I'd love to hear more about muscle protein synthesis and if they're different, um, you know, if, if timing or meal size um, kind of affects that, would, can you provide insights into kind of the ideal timing? Is there a specific time of day where it's optimal or distribution across meals is optimal? Yeah. So, so protein synthesis is regulated in a lot of different ways. But one of the ways kind of meal to meal <clears throat> is regulated is what we call the initiation phase. How does it start? How do you trigger it? And back in the, you know, we discovered um, the role of leucine back in 1998, we've made our first publication on it. And we discovered that leucine, the amino acid leucine has evolved as a very unique signal to muscle. Um, not to get too far into the weeds on this, uh, most amino acids are metabolized in the liver. Uh, and so as you eat protein, a lot of it is metabolized before it ever gets to the blood. But leucine is not. 
the liver has no ability to metabolize leucine. So okay. it shows up in the blood in exactly the proportion of the meal. And muscle has learned to recognize that as a signal of meal quality. <clears throat> and so when leucine comes in, muscle says, ah, that meal has enough protein in it. It's an adequate protein. We can trigger muscle protein synthesis. And it triggers it through that initiation stage through a molecule known as mTOR. Uh, and again, we don't need to go into the weeds on it, but that's sort of a major trigger for this startup phase, to this initiation phase. And so leucine allows us to do that. Um, the meal that becomes probably most important is probably the first meal of the day. So when you go into your sleep period, basically we eat at whatever, seven at night and don't eat again for 12 hours till maybe seven in the morning, your body goes into a catabolic period and you're actually breaking down muscle. That protein turnover process becomes what we call catabolic. Why does it do that? Well, in the middle of the night, when you're not eating, you're sleeping, your liver and your brain and your heart still have to be making protein. So where do they get the amino acids? The body doesn't have a store, so it has to break down muscle to get it. And so all night long, you're breaking it down. And when you wake up in the morning, your body is totally catabolic. You're breaking down muscle and it's going to stay catabolic until you eat enough protein to reverse it. And so what we know is that most Americans eat 60, 65% of their protein in the last meal of the day. And so they get up at breakfast and they'll have whatever, toast and coffee, and then they'll go through the day and maybe have a small salad for lunch. So they're breaking down muscle protein all day long. And we think that's part of the aging process and protein turnover is that we're slowly depleting our muscle all day long. And so what we've looked at is shifting protein to that first meal and shifting the body into what we call an anabolic position as soon as you wake, you know, as soon after waking up as you can. So we stop that process of breaking it down. And we've demonstrated that in weight loss conditions that by adding protein to that first meal, we can blunt muscle loss that occurs during typical weight loss. Fascinating. That is so interesting. So we're basically aging ourselves by not eating protein first thing in the morning and getting our body out of that catabolic state. Yeah, I think so. I think we're kind of accelerating the process that we know that aging is a slowly catabolic process as we get older. But what's the curve look like? Is it a steep decline or is it a more blunted decline? A colleague of mine, Doug Patton Jones, also suggested that humans actually encounter a series of catabolic conditions. He called them catabolic crisis. So as we get older, at some point we get COVID and we're in bed for a week, or you break a bone, or you have to have surgery. And so all of a sudden you're sedentary, maybe even bed rest for a week. And we know as you get older, that becomes a massive loss of muscle that seems to be irrevocable. You can't gain it back. If you lose muscle as a 25 year old, you can go out and starve for a while and you'll gain it back because hormones are still on your side. But if you lose muscle mass as a 55 or 60 year old, chances are it's a permanent loss. So in the same way we think about bone health, we want you to be as healthy a 40 year old as we can make you, either your bones or your muscles, because we wanna prevent that loss as you get older. That is so fascinating. Yeah, I've seen that with my father because he's been battling cancer and each time he's had a some major issue and gone in the hospital for several, several days or, or a week maybe and been sedentary and that, the muscle loss has been extraordinary and the the aging has been yeah. like, I mean, it's, it's we, exactly- We know from a variety of studies, not ones I've done, but from others that survivability in cancer treatment is totally dependent on your muscle mass. 
If you have low muscle mass and they refer to it as cancer cachexia, that actually determines your failure in cancer therapy. So actually having muscle mass is probably the number one protection you can have. If you get, if you're unfortunate enough to get cancer to survive the treatments is totally dependent on your muscle mass. That is fascinating. So what are some of the recommendations to keep that? So if you have cancer, you should be uh, the number one, the number one recommendation for adults and muscle mass is resistance exercise. The number two is protein. So, you know, people will say, well, you know, I don't like doing exercise. Well, that makes protein the number one recommendation because <laughs> at least you can try to do that. But number one, uh, is doing resistance exercise, ideally at least three days a week uh, to try and maintain your muscle mass. And then you want to have adequate protein to support it. And adequate protein in my mind is you have to get above uh, at least 0.6 grams per pound. You have to get above what we refer to as 1.2 grams per kg, uh, which is about 0.6 grams per pound. Or you're not gonna you're not gonna be successful with it. That's great to know. Now, for and the again, I'll go back to distribution. Then the more stress you're under, the more importance we think the distribution is. So, evening it out, breakfast, lunch, dinner, uh, even nighttime protein. You know, as you spread it out, uh, we think that you can keep the body more anabolic for more hours. So. My first recommendation to people is always correct breakfast. If you're not getting 35 to 40 grams of protein in the breakfast, uh, that first meal of the day, and I, I try not to use the word breakfast because, you know, whether, you know, I don't think there's anything magical about 630 versus 930, but I think that first meal is critical. So lots of protein first meal and then spread it out throughout the day. Yeah. So, you know, I, we published a study where we actually did an even distribution. And unfortunately, everybody's kind of locked onto that. I think the first and last meal are the keys. Okay. And I think both of those should be as close to 40 grams as you can make it. I don't think the lunch meal is nearly as important. I think protein's important at it, but I don't know of any data to support there's a magic number to that. The, it's, it's, you know, there's a kind of a debate going on right now, but clearly the first most important thing is your quantity per day. Hmm. And then as you decide on the quantity, then quality comes into picture. If you have a high enough protein intake, if you're eating 160 grams of protein per day, quality is not very important. But if you're only eating 50, quality is really important. And then distribution comes into play. If you're uh, again, eating 200 grams, chances are you can't eat that all in one meal. I don't know that everything else matters too much. And age comes into that. But if you're only eating 50 grams per day, there's a lot of data that you better group some of that into one meal and get it above 30 grams. So again, there, there are three factors. Quantity is always most important. Quality is probably second. Distribution becomes third. I think for adults, certainly older adults, that first meal distribution is critical. That makes a lot of sense because it's like pre your catabolic phase and yeah. post catabolic phase. Right. And we know that, you know, if you're a, if you're a 15, 16 year old and you have 10 grams of protein at breakfast, you will get a muscle protein synthesis response right. because as a child, five grams, 10 grams, 15, you're driven by hormones, you'll get responses. You know, 10 versus 20, you'll get a bigger response at 20 than 10, but you'll still get a response at five and 10. With an adult over 40, five, 10, 50, you'll get no response at all. Until you get to close to 30, you get zero response. So again, children and adults, adults meaning over 40, are very different in how their muscles respond. That's so important to know. And I feel like most people don't know that. Now, for those that are doing um, resistance training, weightlifting and such, are there any specifics around um, optimal timing of protein intake for those that are? Uh, there's again, 
There's a lot of controversy about that. And frankly, my research group's part of the controversy. <laughs> when, we were studying, when we were studying this regulation, the way we studied it, it was with an exhaustive bout of exercise. We did a totally exhaustive about, we could have done starvation, but one of the things we know is that the longer the starvation goes, um, the body, I mentioned at the beginning that we regulate protein synthesis at an initiation phase, but we also, which is called translation, but we also regulate it at the gene phase at DNA level, which mm -hmm. is called transcription. Uh, the longer you go into starvation, you shift the regulation to the gene level transcription. And so we wanted to study very acute changes meal to meal. So we used exhaustive exercise. With one hour of exhaustive exercise, we can shut off muscle protein synthesis. So that's how we used it. And we then showed that muscle would stay shut off until we fed protein. So pro people got the idea that, well, if you exercise, you should have protein right afterwards. But that's not really how it works. Uh, again, we were using one-time, untrained, exhaustive exercise. Um, people who do resistance exercise and train for it, they get the training effect that lasts probably 48 hours. So when you have protein afterwards, it doesn't really matter. Your next meal is fine. So people have kind of, and athletes will carry protein and branch chain amino acids into the gym, and they're taking these expensive drinks as they there's really no benefit to that that we know. So, you know, just do your next meal. If your next meal is going to be six hours after your exercise, okay, maybe there's a benefit. Um, but resistance exercise isn't catabolic like starvation or exhaustive exercise. Once you train for it, the other issue is if you're totally sedentary and you decide you're going to start training, yeah, maybe in the first four or five weeks, uh, maybe protein soon after is beneficial. Maybe it would help with soreness. But if you're well-trained, there's no benefit that we know of having it in the first hour or something. Fascinating. Yeah, that's been a that's been a myth for a very long time. I've been in the fitness industry for a long yeah. time. So it's like, yeah, and it's, you know, it, it comes right from out. it comes from our research. It comes from the way we did it. And there's no question that if you if you do pro if you give protein right after exercise, you will get an anabolic response. But the question is, if you wait and don't do it till three or four hours later at the next meal, do you end up with any net difference in muscle mass? Mm. And the answer is there's no evidence that you do. So we're we're translating a short-term research finding into long-term outcomes. And it doesn't really translate that way. Interesting. So, no harm, but frankly, probably a waste of money. Got it. Good to know. Now, there's a lot of different philosophies um, people have around eating and nutrition. And there's this, you know, uh, fasting, time restricting eating, or people eat a lot of small meals or big meals. Do those types of things kind of, are there specifics we should know around protein intake, around any of those types yeah. of? So I, th I think there are unfortunately a lot of different answers to that, depending on who you are. Right. Uh, are you are you trying to achieve weight loss because you're overweight? Are you trying to be a healthy 65 year old? Are you an athlete trying to build muscle? You know, each one has a little bit different answer. The, the purpose of time restricted eating is to reduce calorie intake. So that by definition means you're trying to reduce calories you're trying to lose fat. Um, we know that um, spreading protein out through the day will minimize fat loss. Will minimize protein loss. If you just if you just do a fast, a lot of people are into fasts. They think there's some sort of a cleanse or something to it. We know that if you go into a fast, you'll lose significant lean body mass, muscle mass very quickly. If you just do a fast and look at say, let's say three days, for example, 50% uh, of your weight loss will be lean body mass. 
And what we know is for older adults, that's not recoverable. And so that's the definition of yo-yo dieting. People continue to do these restrictions. They lose lean body mass. We know if you just restrict calories, uh, that somewhere around 35% of your weight loss will be lean body mass. What we have shown is that if you do weight restriction, calorie restriction, but with a higher protein diet, 1.6 grams per kg, and restrict and resistance exercise two days a week, uh, we can reduce that lean mass to 6%. So 94% is fat. And most people would say that if you lose body fat, probably at least 3% of lean loss is with the fat cell. And so we're basically saying if you do protein and resistance exercise, you can make the weight loss 100% fat. Where if you're doing it with starvation, only 50% is fat. So all of those things come into play as to how you do it. So, uh, you know, I, I'm, I think time-restricted feeding makes some sense. Two meals a day, having one meal at 10, 30 or 11 and another meal at seven, that might make some sense, help people control their calories. The smaller the meals get, the less proteins at the meal and the more heart difficult it is to balance it. You know, if you're only eating a 200 calorie snack, how many people have broccoli? How many people have, you know, high <laughs> yeah. fiber foods? You know, how many people have you know, roast beef? You know, those kinds of things, you know, is it all carbs? What, what, what's the small meal going to look like? Right. So I, I think small, uh, lots of small meals, or something you tend to see with vegetarians, I think it's one of the worst cho choices you can make. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, there's so many, so many different philosophies out there. And uh, this is great information around all of that. Now, do you have any advice for people that want to look in, that want to track their protein intake effectively? Are there any, have any great, you advice? know, that's a, that's a great question. Um, one of the one of the nice things about protein is that we tend to buy it in amounts. Mm. You know, you'll, you'll, have a, you'll have an egg. You know, if I ask you how many eggs did you eat two days ago, you'd give me the exact number. If I ask you, and I don't know your diet, but if I ask you how many carbs you ate two days ago, you could miss it by 150 grams. Uh, most people have no clue. You eat them in snacks. You know, it's a bag, right? If I ask you, how many ounces of milk you had this morning, you'd give me the number. Yeah. If I ask you how much meat, you'd say, well, I had a quarter pounder. I bought a 16 ounce steak. Or I, we tend to buy meats and proteins in amounts that we recognize. So to some extent, it's easy to track. Um, again, I think that when you start thinking about a meal, uh, you need to think about your protein first. If you choose to be a vegetarian, then that means you have other issues you have to think about. If you choose to be an omnivore, make your decision. What amount? I know I need 40 grams, uh, 35 grams. That's at least four ounces of meat. Uh, you know, how am I going to put that together? Uh, you know, make, make your choices. A single egg is six and a half to seven grams. Okay. It's hard to get the 35 grams of protein with just eggs. So that maybe means I need some meats with it, uh, or maybe I need a glass of milk with it. One of the cool things, and you know, a lot of people don't necessarily like milk, but one of the cool things about milk is you can literally titrate your amount. It's one gram per ounce. Do I need six grams, eight grams, 10 grams, 12? You can hit the exact number. Uh, you know, so, you know, I use yogurts and whey protein to hit my targets at breakfast. Uh, they're easy to use. I can do it on the run, etc. cetera. Uh, we found that breakfast is the hardest one. Most people, most Americans will eat meat at dinner. Right. So dinner is usually easy. You know, we teach, again, we teach protein is your center. 
a high fiber of vegetable, some kind of a green colorful vegetable, and then a carbohydrate, three sections. My, our, our participants, our subjects in our weight loss clinic always called it our, our Mercedes Benz plate three sections <laughs> and, you know, you try and balance that out. So, you know, dinner is usually the easiest one. If you get the proportions and get the carbs in check, that one's easy. The hardest one's always that first meal. And again, we, we tend to try and use, um, you know, some simple meal concepts, but we use yogurts and dairy, uh, whey proteins. You know, if you want to use soy proteins or pea proteins, you can do it. Uh, I actually, on my website, we actually have a plant-based protein shake we sell. Uh, so, you know, those are, you can do it, but you need to have a plan. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I can see how breakfast is definitely the most difficult because what do we eat for breakfast? Well, eggs, yeah. bacon, yeah. And, toast. You know, what, what we realized, so, you know, in our studies, we we always called it an egg mix study. So basically <laughs> you can think about a, a traditional egg sandwich, which is, you know, a, an English muffin, uh, a Canadian bacon, a slice of cheese and an egg. Uh, that's about 10 grams of protein. So if you take two of them, throw away half the bread and put it together, now you're at about 25 and you can have a small glass of milk with it. Now you've hit your 30. So that's how we would teach it to our subjects. Here's a, here's something you can do going out. You know, you just put them together. One of the secrets to breakfast is increase the amount of the protein, the ham, the Canadian bacon, whatever, turkey sausage, increase the amount of the, the meat because it's more dense to go with your egg and your cheese. Ah, oh, that's a great idea. And you said you teach us. So you have a you have a, a website and structure around this where you actually teach. So so we clients. had for 10 years, we had a weight loss clinic at the University of Illinois. So we we taught this uh to well over 200 subjects. And and so people I would talk about and people would say, Well, how do I get this? And it's like, well, you know, I didn't write a book or anything. <laughs> Sorry, I you know, we have the publications, but those yeah. are hard for people to read. So we basically developed a website. So we have a website called metabolictransformation.com. Uh, and basically we have the diet there. And like I said, one of the things that we found most difficult was people to get breakfast right. So we created a, a meal replacement shake to do it. Yeah. Uh, right now we have basically a plant-based one and in January we'll re we're gonna introduce a second one, which is basically all dairy-based. Beautiful. That is so helpful. I'm going to definitely check that out and I'll post a link below for everybody to check out as well. Now, there are all these different types now of plant-based meats, synthetic meats, uh, lab-grown meats now mm -hmm. that I think Bill Gates has been working on for a long time. What is your take on those as far as a nutritional standpoint? I mean, we've had like soy-based meat substitutes, sausage for a long time. They're okay. Um, I have to realize they're ultra processed foods. So they have a lot of ingredients. Many of the ingredients aren't FDA approved. So you don't really know what they are. Um, but that is a solution. So if you're going to be vegan, then that's a good way to do it. Most of those products have less protein per ounce. So where uh, animal based meats uh, will have seven to eight grams per ounce a lot of those plant-based are only six so again you need you know a four ounce patty is not the same uh and it's lower quality and it probably has lower digestibility lower um uh, bioavailability so all of those things come into play but again if you're trying to be more plant-based that's fine um as far as lab grown um Based on anything right now, I don't think it's ever going to be economically feasible. Mm. Uh, and basically, all of the lab-grown meats begin with animal proteins. They use uh, bovine serum albumin. They use stem cells. So the only way they can grow it is having animal proteins to start with. Yeah. So I think lab-grown things is a great waste of money right now. Uh, 
Plant-based proteins that are isolated, I think, are viable. Uh, you mentioned bugs and worms and things like that. I think all of those may come into play. And frankly, bugs and worms have higher quality than plants. <laughs> and so they're a little bit more like animal protein. So if you really like cricket or roach meal, okay. It's a long time before I'm ever going to go that way. <laughs> but, you know, I think, you know, I, you know, there are other cultures that have eaten things like mealworms and stuff like that. Just frankly, not, I'm not that adventurous. So, you know, <laughs> I'm going to stick with my dairy and egg proteins. <laughs> I am I'm right there with you. <laughs> now, as we were kind of talking about before, um, you know, a lot of Americans shop in the middle aisles and we buy this processed packaged food. So I feel like many of our children, as a consequence, are probably not getting sufficient amounts or good quality proteins. What are some of the potential consequences of protein deficiency in childhood and how can that impact long term health? Really early in my career, um, I was really studying malnutrition in children. It's interesting as a researcher, when you're young and early in your career, you tend to study growth. And as you get older, as I am now, you tend to study aging. I don't know yeah. what that means. But <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, uh, early in my career, I was studying malnutrition in Africa. And one of the things that we saw was that in protein calorie malnutrition, truly deficiency, the children are growth stunted. And once they are growth stunted, they never will recover normal skeletal mass. And so they're basically destined to be obese. They're going to have a bad body composition. A good example of that is India now. So basically India is what we call skinny fat. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at a lot of Indian individuals, they look thin, but what they have is extremely low muscle mass. Mm -hmm. And India is now the number two country for diabetes in the world, even though they have no obesity. Uh, what they are is over fat, but under muscled. And that's part of where Gabrielle and I get the concepts of muscle centric medicine is that if your muscle is healthy, it helps you survive cancer treatment. If your muscle is healthy, chances are diabetes is not going to be in your future. If your muscles are healthy, your blood lipids will be more normal. Muscle is sort of the center of metabolism. And the more we neglect it, the more of these problems we get into. We've had this for since I was a graduate student 40 years ago, we've had the focus on obesity as a fat problem. And so what you're studying is the pathology of a disease. And what we wanna study is how do you correct it? How do you prevent it? Fat is a pathology. If you if you decided I'm going to be fat forever, then how you choose your fats probably matters. But if you're choosing to be healthy and you're gonna make muscle healthy, then how you treat carbohydrates and fat and protein is a totally different story. And we have seen that in all of our weight loss studies. If you make muscles healthy, diabetes basically goes away. Wow. Wow. And what do you mean by make muscles healthy? Is this a combination of protein in your diet and- Protein and exercise and yeah, making protein. Protein, protein turnover is a very expensive process. It takes a lot of effort. Uh, and, and recreating those proteins makes your muscles healthier. It makes you more mobile activities of daily life, but it also allows you to metabolize carbohydrates and fat differently. Um, some estimates are that muscle protein turnover may account for, and you know we can think about this in different ways, but a third of your energy expenditure per day is in muscle protein turnover. If you do that wrong, uh, you're destined to deposit fat. You may have heard about thermogenesis of diets and people, you know, that protein produces a lot more heat. We, you know, have gone through Thanksgiving and we're coming up on Christmas and you have that big turkey meal and you sort of have this warm feeling for a while. Part of that's thermogenesis. We know that protein 
approximately 30% of the calories or protein will be burned off as energy, where it's only about five to 10, five percent for fat and carbohydrate for fat and carbohydrates. Wow. Uh, why does protein have it? If you read a basic nutrition textbook, it'll say, well, because protein is harder to digest and absorb and metabolize, but we don't think that's it at all. We think it's muscle protein turnover. Muscle protein turnover, the more often you trigger that, the more expensive the process is. And we think that's the energy expenditure. So part of that is just, you know, if we make muscle the center of our thinking, we just do metabolism better. And can you explain a little more muscle protein turnover and kind of how we improve that? So as I said at the beginning, we need to make around 250 to 300 grams of new protein per day in the body. Okay. The majority of that <clears throat> goes to organs, liver, kidney, brain, almost 75%. So that means of that 300 grams, only about what, I don't do the math, 75 grams of it's going to muscle. Muscle makes up 50% of the protein in your body, but it's only getting 25% of the effects. So as you get older, that's an increasingly bigger problem. And that's part of the wasting we see. So what we're trying to do is accelerate that process, keeps your muscle proteins healthier. Uh, it also spends a lot of energy. It keeps your mitochondria healthy, which is why you can burn carbohydrates and fats. Uh, the primary fuel of muscle is actually fats. The fuel it wants to burn is fats. Uh, we sometimes get lost in with extreme athletes and we hear, hear about carbohydrate loading and things like that. But, you know, so if you're an extreme marathoner or cross country skier, you know, ultra marathoner, triathlete, that may be important. But for the average American, we only need about 100 grams of carbohydrates per day. The average American is eating 300. So that's why we're obese. Yeah. Um, the argument we always make with people is you should start thinking around 100 grams of protein or carbohydrates. You can have, you can have five servings of, you can have five servings of vegetables, two to three servings of fruit, and three servings of bread carbohydrates, and a serving is 15 grams with 100 grams of carbohydrates. Again, people are eating 300. Beyond that 100, you can earn carbohydrates with exercise, and that's the only way. And you can earn it at a rate of somewhere between 40 and 60 grams per hour of exercise. Hmm. And so for 300 grams per day, that means the average American needs to put in three hours of intense exercise every day to justify that. Hence, that's why we're obese. Yeah. People are that basically sedentary. Yeah. <laughs> They're certainly not putting in three hours of exercise. Absolutely not. That is so fascinating. Now, speaking of fats, um, for decades, I feel like there's been a war on fat and research, researchers have said that saturated fats in a person's diet can cause potential harm, which are found in, you know, meats, cheeses, butters, milk, um, and recommendations have typically pointed to a low fat diet as the best way to reduce things like heart disease and other cardiovascular diseases. But as we've seen, people have, as they've steered away from these, you know, dietary fats, there's been this huge uptick in cardiovascular diseases and obesity over the last 40 years. So what is your take and um, how do you perceive saturated fats from your research for our health? Yeah. So um, let me, let me just start by agreeing with it. You just said that uh, starting in the 70s into the 80s, we've had this anti-cholesterol saturated fat argument. And during the next 40 years, the US has decreased milk, dairy consumption, egg consumption, and beef consumption by over 35%. And so people did what they were being told. Uh, and yet we have this enormous increase in obesity, diabetes, and no change in heart disease or cancer. Uh, what people replaced it with was with grains. 
40% increase in calories from grains, which is what we've been talking about, too many carbs. Uh, we're eating more carbs than we can handle from a metabolism, especially with sedentary lifestyle. Uh, saturated fat, there's a lot of research looking at saturated fat versus unsaturated fats. Um, first thing to remember with that research is it's almost always done with excess calories and excess carbs. So the people are in a net storage condition. So one of the things I always say to people is, if you're committed to being fat for the rest of your life, you probably should pay attention to the kinds of fat you eat. However, if you're committed to muscle-centric health and having the right body composition, saturated fats, no problem at all. The, if you look at human evolution, the human has evolved over millions of years and we evolved to make fat in our body. And the only fat we can make is palmitate, salt, a saturated fat, which people say is the most dangerous. Well, if it's actually dangerous, why aren't we all dead? I mean, if it's the only one we evolved, why did the body do that? So it's not that the fat is dangerous, it's the environment you put it into. And if you put it into an environment of too many calories and too many carbs, too much insulin, now it becomes dangerous because you're in a net storage, net inflammatory stage. So I think there's a lot of data. I think just like we saw the recommendation for cholesterol disappear in 2010, I think we're going to see the recommendation about saturated fats going to disappear also because the data doesn't support it. One of the things that in science to always remember is if a, there's always theories and the theory will gain support over time if it's true or it will get more controversial over time if it's not. And what we know is that cholesterol got more and more controversial and saturated fats getting more and more controversial. It's because it doesn't always work. And the reason it doesn't work is it's totally confounded by calories and carbohydrates. That is very good to know. Now being in the science- One of the other things I'd like to say on that, uh, you know, one of my pet expressions is, if saturated fat is so toxic, then give me a number. People will say it should only be 10% of your diet. So that means an athlete who's eating 4,000 calories can, per day can have 60 grams of saturated fat in their diet and be perfectly healthy. Where a 65 year old woman who only needs 1400, 16 grams is toxic. That makes no sense at all. If saturated fat's really dangerous, how can 60 or 45 grams be okay for one person and 16 be toxic for another? That is simply not biochemistry. That's that's witchcraft. That's just, that's Ouija board science. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I, I mean, I've talked to several um, scientists who are have their degrees in biochemistry and I feel like that is like, where the real knowledge is at when it comes to health and wellness. Yeah. Like that is yeah. it. Yeah. It just, it just doesn't work. It, it, you know, again, if, if you have an environment of too many calories, too much carbohydrate, too much insulin, now you've affected how the body will handle that. And you can see, you know, inflammatory responses, but it wasn't the saturated fat that caused it. Got it. Now, being somebody that works in the field of science and in research, and um, you know, you've done many studies. From what you've seen, does industry funding impact nutrition studies? And should we? Are there any precautions um, we should take when interpreting research funded by industry sources? Sure. You know, as a person who's had um, industry funding. Uh, you know, I think it comes down to the ethics of the investigator. Mm -hmm. uh, we have discovered uh, a lot of things about protein in the last 20 years. The discoveries that we made about muscle-centric health and would never have been made if it wasn't for funding from Kraft and the Dairy Council and the Beef Council and some of those who inherently had a protein interest, okay? Uh, you just wouldn't have done it. 
So my attitude about discoveries is first to evaluate what level they're looking at. You know, if you're looking at total protein, well, you can get protein from all kinds of sources. Just saying that, you know, you should have 1.2 grams per kg. You could get that from plants. You could get it from animals. That doesn't make one source absolute. So just because it was funded by dairy doesn't mean dairy's the answer. You could get it from soy if you want. Um, my, I have a two sort of theories about those kinds of things. Um, one is I never believe a study until it's repeated by two more labs. So if I see a study by Joe that says something outlandish, I'll say, well, that's interesting. Can I find anybody else who supports it, who isn't supported by the same group? Once I see it in a couple different places, I'll start believing it, okay? But I never believe anything. I don't even believe anything I produce if it's the same, until it's reproduced. <laughs> you know, we've got some studies that haven't been reproduced by other labs. So I always take those with a grain of salt. It's not because the beef industry funded it. It's because I don't know if it's believable. The other place I look is if somebody's trying to sell a novel product. We've got this product X that we put together and it has this ingredient and that ingredient and it's funded by the company that owns the rights to it. I always get really suspicious, you know? So, you know, I treat things that are looking at saturated fat or protein or carbohydrates that are funded by an industry very different than I do a product X that looks like it's novel and it has some unique plant from Brazil in it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. I read many, many studies from my, my work with Epic times and that's always my strategy. I always try to find numerous studies saying the sure. same, same. I mean, thing. there's a reason that there are all these studies that come out of foreign countries that are published in the journal of nowhere uh, that have are advocating some product. They can't pass scrutiny in mainstream journals. Uh, so they get published in Southeast Journal of something. Uh, you know, there I forget how many journals are out there. We refer to them as predatory journals. They basically will publish anything you pay to publish. Uh, so, you know, if, if it's published in, you know, the Journal of Nutrition or the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, I'll pay attention to it. If it's the journal of something from Southeast Asia, I probably won't spend time reading it. That is a great point. It's I came across this when I was doing my um, research on a series a, a, around fluoride. And I noticed there was um, a specific company is kind of like a science for hire company. And they're involved in many of the lawsuits that have yeah. to do with um the chemical industry and sure. the chemical industry will hire them to create these scientific studies saying that, sure. oh no, their, their chemical is not harmful here. Agent actually, one, one of the, one of the sci scientists for hire that was the head scientist for against, I think she was the EPA scientist um, saying uh, fluoride, fluoride was actually not harmful. She had written a scientific study on agent orange uh -huh. saying it was not harmful to human beings. Wow. I, like, I didn't <laughs> yeah. know that was a thing. I didn't know there was science for hire. I didn't know you could, people would create these studies for these. I mean, that I found. You know, I grew up, as I said at the beginning, grew up on a farm in the Midwest and we were using 2,4-D as a primary herbicide uh, on the farm. And that is Agent Orange. Uh, it's basically oh. been totally banned now in for U.S. agricultural use, but it was widely used in the 50s, 60s in agriculture in the U.S. And they sort of used a supercharged form in, in Vietnam in Agent Orange, but that's what it was. Interesting. I had no idea they used that in the U.S. Oof. Yeah. So I feel bad. A lot of the, the vets. Have you know, a lot of people go off about, you know, GMOs and things like that. But you ha always need to frame that as what's the alternative. 
Agent Orange was an alternative. <laughs> That's what they used on corn. Now we don't have to do it because of GMO quality. So anyway, you know, one has to be reasonable about thinking about things like that and really assess the science. And to your point, there's a lot of very off the wall comments that get into social media now that really aren't very science based. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's a great point of of seeing the alternative. And yeah, if we're choosing between GMOs and Agent Orange, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a pretty easy choice. You know? And yeah. you know, for the for the most part, you know, humans don't eat field corn. It's fed to animals. So you know, we have a whole nother you know, you know, what is GMO? Well, it's a genetic manipulation and corn never has DNA in it when it's eaten by humans. So, you know, it's sort of like, well, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a whole debate on that. Um, yeah. I want to jump back to our muscle real quick. Cause I've, I've read in your work, you talk about how, you know, glu um, the role of muscle in glucose storage, which are our body's primary source of energy, which I think is, I, I didn't know that. Can you talk a bit about the connection between um, muscle and glucose storage and insulin resistance? So, so let me let me alter your statement a little bit. Muscle is critical for glucose utilization. Ah, uh, okay. It's, it is a primary site in the body for storage. Uh, and that gets used during starvation uh, in in overnight fasting and extreme exercise. Uh, but what's important is that it's a role, it, muscle's important for glucose metabolism and insulin sensitivity and fat metabolism. And so we wanna keep our muscles active so that we can burn those things, uh, the mitochondria, et cetera. Uh, glucose is interesting in that we have this absolute need for glucose for certain tissues, the brain, the red blood cell, the kidney. And that's where that sort of hundred grams per day comes from. Uh, that's how much we need. Uh, we can actually make that from protein for every, for make the, about 60% of protein will turn into glucose. So for a hundred grams of protein, we'll get about 60 grams of carbohydrate glucose. So if you need a hundred, grams of glucose, uh, you'd have to eat 130, 140 grams of protein to do it. So people will say, well, why don't we just do it from protein? Frankly, that's really inefficient because then, you know, if you're using all your protein to make glucose, then that means you need more protein to make proteins. Uh, and so that's just an inefficient approach. So I always start diets with saying, you know, I, I want you to have a hundred, 120 grams of protein and I think you should limit your carbs to about a hundred. So about a one-to-one -one ratio. And then we can go from there, more exercise, more carbs, less exercise, less carbs, uh, more, more body mass, want to gain muscle, more protein. So we can adjust, but those are sort of the starting points. So muscle is an important site for uh, carbohydrate and fat metabolism, but you have to keep the carbs under control. Uh, people will say, well, what causes insulin insensitivity? Well, glucose is actually toxic in the body. It has its own disease. We call it diabetes. And so excess carbs have to get eliminated. And the only real way we can eliminate it is either with muscle activity or with insulin. And so when you use insulin to get rid of it, where does it put it? It stuffs it into muscle or it stuffs it into fat, okay? People think that insulin regulates blood glucose, but actually insulin is only a fail safe against high blood glucose. And if you continue to use your insurance policy against risk all the time, eventually it fails. And eventually that's what type two diabetes is we eventually will burn out the pancreas trying to use insulin all the time. And muscle protects itself from glucose toxicity by becoming insulin insensitive. So what we need to do is tailor our carbohydrate intake to our muscle activity. And that's why we need muscle-centric help. So we could avoid 
diabetes altogether. Exactly. That strategy. And we know there's lots of studies about metabolic syndrome, type two diabetes. If you drive carbohydrate intake low enough, you can basically cure it. Wow. At the very least, you can cut your medications in half or more. If you metabolic syndrome, if you just have elevated insulin, elevated um, blood sugar, elevated triglycerides, you can totally correct those conditions within two weeks with a low carb diet. This is vital information for everybody. Um, yeah. Thank you so, so much. This has been yeah, well, it's, you know, it's, you know, I think it's information that the public doesn't get. It's not the message people are getting out there. Uh, and it's not, it's knowledge that we know when I left the university, uh, you know, I'd spent 31 years at the University of Illinois doing science, publishing papers. And what I realized was science research doesn't get to the public very well. Uh, the medical profession in general is about 20 years behind the science of nutrition. And so when I left the university, I thought, you know, I've got the opportunity to talk to the public. Um, I'm pretty good. One of my skills is translating very complex biochemistry into lay messages. And I said, I think I'm going to do that in the next phase of my life. And I've, I've gotten the opportunity to do that either you know, on Twitter or with talks or in various things. And so, you know, that's kind of the crusade I'm on is I would like to get the general public, give them more access to what we actually know about nutrition and people like you give me that forum. <laughs> no, absolutely. It's, it's, it's um, interesting. You mentioned that because throughout our conversation, I kept thinking you are such a, I can tell you're a professor because you're so good at explaining complex things in a simple way so we can understand because I like I said I read a lot of scientific studies sometimes I need help <laughs> interpreting them because I'm like yeah. I'm not sure I mean, that's, that's talking you know about. it's one of the it's one of the things I enjoy doing and it's one of the skills I've always realized I had it's um I think it's because I grew up in a sort of a poor rural area you know people weren't all just brilliant you know I grew up around blue collar people and so I understand talking to the average lay person. Uh, you know, I joke about I'm good at talking to the layman, right? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, I you know, it's something I enjoy doing, and I definitely I, I know I have a skill in doing that. And so I like doing that. That's funny. When I I use ChatGPT to translate some of my scientific studies, and that I'll say, please translate this in layman's terms, and then <laughs> I'll copy right. and paste like the, the 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 last part of it, and it will translate. And I'm like, oh, that's what it all means. Yeah. Um, yeah. No. Thank you so much. This is incredible, and it's it's you've given so much incredible information around muscle and nutrition. Um, again, if you want to mention to our listeners that want to follow you and follow your work and find your website, and if you have any other resources you recommend um, for those listening that want to learn more, um, do you want to share that with us? Yeah. So, uh, it, so my Twitter. I'm on Twitter. I'm not. I don't do a lot of social media, but I am on Twitter, and I don't post about vacations or anything. I don't post about science and it's at Don Lehman. So that's real easy. Uh, and I do have a web, you know, a website and it's metabolic transformation.com. And again, the purpose we put it out, you know, wasn't the idea that we're going to make a lot of money or do anything with it. People ask us about the weight loss diet. So there's a lot of very good lay information there about how does metabolism work? How do, how do you put together diets like this? And you can actually get the diet we used at the University of Illinois. It's fully described there. So anyway, that those are great. Uh, I love doing podcasts. You mentioned my colleague, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon. Uh, she and I do a lot of work together. Uh, she has a new book out, which is actually dedicated to me called Forever Strong. So you'll see a lot of our work there. That was, you know, top three New York Times bestseller list. Uh, and so there's a good source. Um, and we do a lot of podcasts together. So I never put in the time to do the podcast, but she and I talk all the time. And, you know, you can follow her uh, and you'll find me a, a lot. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, we're, we're, in, we're 
currently talking with her as well. So maybe we'll have her on to, to chat it more about muscle in her book and uh, on all her work with you. That'd be wonderful. Well, I will post uh, links to um, all of your things below your website and her book and your Twitter, et cetera. Thank you so much for sharing your wealth of knowledge and insights with us today. Your, your work has been so groundbreaking and I'm so grateful that you're able to communicate it all with us in a way we can all comprehend. <laughs> I'll mention one other one, uh, which people probably aren't aware of. If you, if you go into Google, there's something called Google scholar. Okay. Oh yes. And if you go into Google scholar and just put in, DK Lehman and weight loss, you'll get a whole listing of my publications, multiple yeah. pages of it. So if you really want to see studies and what we actually published, it's all out there in that form. Oh, thank you so much. That's I will post a link to that below so everybody can uh, look up all the studies and research and look into it yourself. Uh, before we wrap it up, do you have any closing thoughts or advice? Let's say somebody who's obese and is wanting to lose the fat. Um, do you have any advice around where they start uh, regarding nutrition and kind of getting towards their goal of losing weight? Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I think that, you know, shifting to a protein centric, you know, muscle centric idea is important. If you can do exercise, that's great, but at least get the protein front and center. Try and increase your fiber in that vegetable section and try and get your carbohydrates under control. Most people who are overweight do too much snacking. They eat too many carbs outside of meals. Uh, and those are things they have to correct. And we find that when people begin to correct those things, uh, they can begin to get it under control. So snacking to me, uh, I often will tell people that uh, there's no metabolic reason you ever need snacks and people will start going ballistic on me. But if you create your meals correctly, you really shouldn't need snacks. And that's probably the major place. And then portion size is where Americans make the mistakes. Okay. So anyway, those are, those are where we usually start you know, people trying to think about. And the other, you know, the other one is people eat a lot of food out and restaurants uh, are designed to give you too many calories because that means you feel like you got your money's worth, but it's not equivalent to good health. So basically, you know, how do you get away from cleaning your plate? <laughs> It's those American American proportions, I always say, when I get yeah, my, totally. my dinner from a restaurant. It's very different yeah. from when you go to Europe. Exactly. It's a, I mean, people talk about the French paradox and having just come back a couple of months ago from France, they eat incredibly great foods, rich foods, protein, carbohydrate, protein, fat oriented, but the proportions are quite small. Yeah. They're very satisfying. And one of the things we now know is that carbohydrate-based food is not very satisfying. It's fun to eat. It tastes good. It's sort of sweet, but it makes, you know, what what was the potato chip? We'll not mention brands, but their slogan was, we bet you can't eat just one. Yeah. Uh, that says it all. <laughs> We've designed food to make you overeat. Exactly. They have all sorts of tricks these days with their little... Yeah ingredient hidden ingredients that are yeah addicting so anyway it's been a pleasure christy and uh hopefully your listeners will uh, enjoy the talk oh i'm sure they will thank you so much if you like this video please like and share it with others this information could really help someone you may know and if you haven't already hit that subscribe button to be sure you don't miss out on our future shows and i will see you all next wednesday on our next episode of discovering true health